Hi, I'm Meryn Somerset Webb and I am here today with Russell Napier. Russell used to be a strategist at CLSA, or should I say the strategist at CLSA, but he's recently launched his own business. So first we're going to talk about that and then we're going to talk quite a lot about the markets. So Russell, tell me about your new business. Well, my new business is a continuation of the old, which is me writing independent research and marketing that to institutional investors. The bit that's very new is almost a second business, which is how that research is distributed. And it's distributed through a platform called ERIC. So most of the people watching this will know the FCA is very keen that we unbundle research from commissions. And now explain, explain what that means to a, a, a retail viewer. Sure. So most of the institutions that your uh, viewers have their money with receive research for free. But it's not for free because in return they deal with their stockbroker. And they're paying a higher commission because that research is coming in than they would do if they weren't getting any commission. So in the, in the uh, opinion of the FCA, the stockbroker is really using his client's money to get the research. So they're very keen that we split it up. And in future, your fund manager will pay for the research, not you indirectly through your commission. So Eric, the website is there to offer unbundled, individually priced research where fund managers can buy it with their own money and not with their clients' money. No, fund managers don't like that kind of thing, do they? Buying things with their own money? Well, it's funny you say that. First of all, some of them do. Uh, there are some of them who think it's a very good idea because they're not enamoured with the quality of research which comes through the broken community and they think they're paying for a huge bundle of stuff and only using a small percentage of it. Uh, but of course, the, perhaps the most important thing is the regulator thinks that you should pay with their own money. And the regulator seems dogmatically to keep going on this issue, so they may not have a choice anyway. Okay, so will the result of this be that we, as a, as a market, get less research and better research? The, the institutions will get less research, for sure, and they should get better research. Well, if they're going to pay for it, they're going to make sure that they get better research. The dross will disappear. The bad analysts will vanish from the market. Yeah, the only reason I paused is that my estimate is that the mind of research will fall by 85%. I think 15% of it's good anyway. So whether we can improve the quality of it, I think we can improve the independence of it for sure. Uh, I'm sure most people watching this will know there are certain conflicts of interest for stock analysts working with inside broking companies, which should be significantly diminished for stock analysts working outside broking companies. So independence is potentially at least as important as quality, uh, and that I think will very clearly go up. Okay. Now, your research has been very keenly watched for years. Your institutional clients, your old institutional clients, can now get it on ERIC. But I think the problem here is that retail investors, non-professional investors, can't use ERIC. Am I right? That's right. And according to the legal advice we have is that ERIC is a platform for regulated investors. Uh, and, of course, any analyst who's writing will also have to be regulated as well. So, unfortunately, it can't be open to members of the public. Okay, uh, so... We will keep investigating that, but I don't suspect there'll be any change in that. Okay, but luckily for Money Week readers, we have you here today to tell us what you're thinking about at the moment. Yes. How long have you got? <laughs> we have quite a long time. We have quite a long time. So, let's start at the beginning. You are a firm believer, as I understand it, in in the idea that we live in a deflationary environment and there's almost nothing that central banks can do to change that. So maybe we can talk a little bit about why you think that is. Okay. First, why we're in a deflationary environment. Sure. There, there are some very, very big building blocks of this. Uh, and, and just before I go into those, the reason that we in recent time have deflation is not because supply is bigger than demand. That's not the dangerous deflation. You could, might actually say that might be quite a good deflation. It's because at some stage in that transition process from inflation downwards, we have a credit event which creates a shock for the financial system. Of course, that's famously what happened 2008, 2009, but that also happened in 1998 with Russia and then on to LTCM, and it happened in 1982 with Mexico and the banking system. So when we talk about deflation, people say, well, what's so wrong with falling prices? And the answer is that usually that undermines somebody's corporate cash flow, somebody goes bankrupt and we get a credit event, and that's the likely way it goes forward. It has to be a big one country very large financial institution, but I could name, certainly in the country front, we could name a, name a few. Uh, so that's why it's important, that's, why it's, that's how it's likely to happen. Mm -hmm. In terms of the big deflationary forces, oh, there's a significant overproduction in China, very well documented. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that probably the potentially biggest one is the, 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 the aging of the baby boom generation and their move away from consumption to saving, and perhaps even more important, their de-gearing 
and what that means for the efficacy of monetary policy going forward. And just in the short run, a strong dollar. A strong dollar has always been bad for people who link to the dollar. Runs forces them to a, a tighter monetary policy. I could go on on the forces of deflation. Techno I technology in particular, we could talk about for a whole hour and the deflationary impacts of technology, but there are many, many of them. But let's get back briefly to, to demographics. You are partly blaming the deflationary impulse in the global economy on uh, baby boomers in America de-gearing. Yes, not just America, but the baby boom phenomenon is, is, is everywhere. If you look at the balance sheet of the baby boomers, and remember now that, that something important happens this Christmas. As of the 31st of December at midnight, there will not be a baby boomer in the world who is less than 50. The last baby boomer turns 50. So people always think they're retiring. They're not retiring. They're about 69 to 50. Now, they're preparing to retire. They're hoping to retire. And the simple rule of retirement is retire your debt or don't retire. Now, it turns out not only are there a demographic bulge, they are a big dominant uh, customer of the banking system. Mm. Now, if we go back to sort of monetary economics 101, money is created by banks extending credit, and in the process, they create deposits. And if their biggest customer is de-gearing for structural demographic reasons, then it's going to be incredibly difficult for monetary policy to generate all this money that we need to inflate away our debt. So five, six years ago, the general view was, look at this monetary policy that the central banks are running, there'll be lots of money. It hasn't worked. Why? Because the banks haven't lent the money. Common uh, diagnosis of that is the banks don't want to lend the money, but I think people are forgetting there's a very strong headwind of that baby boom generation who want to repay their debts. Okay, now we've been here before with demographics and deflation in Japan. Mm -hmm. Is this a, a, just a repeat of that experience? That's similar, but you've got to remember that Japan's about 15 years ahead in terms of the demographics, so our demographics don't look dissimilar to Japan in the mid 1990s. So this could be one of the reasons why monetary policy is not as powerful as it used to be. I think the way you should look at quantitative easing, which is the way it was looked at by the man who invented it, Irving Fisher, is that it's the oil in the machine, but not the accelerator. So what Fisher said is that there's sometimes when a society has to de-gear, it's natural, and I would say that's where we are with the baby boom generation. If you don't create money as you de-gear, then you get a 1929-1932 experience. And Fisher said the central banker has to be in there creating money as the credit comes down. And that way we don't get the sort of high friction and the high dislocations that we had during the 29-32 period. Now, in that extent, I think quantitative easing has succeeded to the extent that some private sectors, not all of them, but some, particularly the American private sector, the household sector, has smoothly, fairly smoothly de-geared mm -hmm. is the success of quantitative easing, but it hasn't forced anybody to re-gear. It hasn't generated more growth. It's done what Fisher said it has, would do, but it hasn't done what the current Fed said it would do, which is sort of pushes back into high levels of nominal GDP growth, where debt to GDP ratio start to decline. It certainly hasn't done it in Europe. So on this interpretation, QE can prevent disaster but it can't improve the underlying economy and it can't create inflation quickly. It was designed to stop a debt deflation. It seems to have succeeded. Everything else is a new and modern claim for it and it doesn't seem to be succeeding in that. Okay, so is there anything else that the central banks can do to create inflation or are we at a dead end now? I, if we're sitting here in 10 years, I'm fairly sure we'll have inflation. I'm fairly sure nominal GDP growth will be above the growth of debt and all the democracies will be getting rid of debt in their tried and traditional methodology and, and way. I think we'll attribute it though to the People's Bank of China and not to the Federal Reserve. We need a monetary policy which can generate, well, a central bank policy which can generate money and final demand. And it seems to me the obvious place where that can happen is China, where you have a younger generation who are let's say pro-consumption is a nice euphemism for the younger generation of China. And if we could get consumer debt flowing to them uh, in a better way, then I think they would go out and, and consume a lot. It would be very, very easy for China to have 30 40% money supply growth within a year, year and a half, if they chose to do it. And I think that's how we... China could potentially reflate the world. But here's the catch. Highly unlikely to do that without devaluing the currency in the process. So that's something we are going to have to live through, I believe, a major de devaluation of the Chinese currency. But the good news is that could set the field for true independent monetary policy in China, an end to their mercantilist pro-export system, a move towards consumerism. But we can't get that move until we change the monetary policy. Okay, but when, on you, the dollar. when you say we'll have to live through a devaluation of, mm. the, of the currency, what, what do you mean? What, what's, the, what's the impact of well, I'm old enough to Well, I'm old enough to have lived through the last one. So I witnessed what the last one meant. And then when the last one happened, China was a much smaller economy. But the implications of that are China 
came, became dramatically competitive and mm -hmm. undermined all its competitors uh, and was directly responsible for the Asian economic crisis. And we were directly responsible for the bankruptcy of Russia, directly responsible for problems in Latin America. So in the initial drop in the Chinese exchange rate, we get a huge deflationary pulse heading out through the world uh, from all, pri all goods priced in dollars, but presumably even in euros and potentially even in yen when it happens. Now we've got to weather that. Mm -hmm. We've got to weather it politically, we've got to weather it economically, mm -hmm. uh, and I think we should try to do that because it's going to be very painful. But if the repercussions of that are a China which can produce a genuine expansion based upon demand and not supply, because remember the, the history really of their last few business cycles has been creating more supply. Yeah. If we can shift it through this to supply, we've got to hold on and get through the difficult bit. But the difficult bit will be very difficult. If you had six years of quantitative easing and get deflation anyway, that might get some people quite concerned. Mm. But would you then, and apart from that, would you expect more quantitative easing from the US, or do you think the Fed realises at this point that it's not working and they're done? No, I think back to, to that more. initial point on quantitative easing, you have to keep doing it because you have to keep broad money growing. That doesn't mean it's a necessary but not sufficient. Mm. Mm. You, know, you asked, is there anything else that monetary policy could do we picked on China? There are things that policy can do elsewhere. So if I had to pick the most likely thing to happen to reflate the United States of America, it would be the forgiveness of student debt. Now that isn't a monetary policy, that's a fiscal policy. The Federal Reserve can't do that, they'd need a government to do that. Now when America has a government, maybe we'll find out whether it can do that. Uh, but I think the time is coming when, the, given the simple choice, do we extend the central bank balance sheet by one trillion dollars worth of wealthy people's assets, or do we move one trillion dollars worth of student debt from the student onto the state, mm -hmm. that will take the second decision and not the first decision. Now the first thing students will do if you forgive them a trillion dollars of debt is borrow a trillion dollars. That's a recovery. Now when, when that becomes politically acceptable, who knows, but I suspect the time is not far away when the focus falls on that for reflation and not monetary policy. So all the investors believe that the only thing that can happen from here on in is more monetary policy, more buying of their assets, everybody who owns assets gets wealthier. There are other ways, but they're fiscal their government policy rather than monitoring. Yeah, well, a lot of people say that QE is effectively a fiscal policy anyway because of the way it transfers wealth. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, we are we have certainly moved into a world where the true independence of central bankers has to be questioned. And as soon as you question their independence, you're questioning whether they're part of fiscal policy. Mm, okay. Um, back to China then. What? When do you think this happens? How does this happen? What, what makes China decide to reflate and save the world? Mm. Well, China has had a, a, an incredibly strange financial system in that they have retained the command economy banking system. Changed many things in China but held on to that. They've had an economy which has grown where money supply growth has grown at double nominal GDP. So it's an economy with a command economy banking system which has needed a huge amount of money to grow. At this stage, money supply growth is down at a very low level. Now that suggests, when we've seen this historically, that the financial system may begin to creak at the edges. It may be not that stable. Mm -hmm. It may be unstable. Uh, whether it's the formal system or the informal system, things might start to go wrong. Now there's a very simple playbook for that. We've seen it in 2008, 2009. We've seen it over and over again. What do you do when your financial system starts to creak, uh, when it looks like it might crack, the bank capital might decline? You print money. Now, if you're going to print money and you have an exchange rate target, you're going to massively increase the supply of the currency, it's most likely, not inevitable, but most likely that the exchange rate will come down. So I think they'll go to the America, they'll probably go directly to Tim Geithner, they'll probably hire him as an advisor. What do we do now, Tim? Tim will say, well, you can print money. Okay, let's try that. And then they can go to America and say, well, the currency came down, but look, we had to let that happen, because if we didn't let that happen, our financial system would be in trouble. And that's exactly what you did. And that's the playbook for China when the time is necessary. They've undervalued the currency since 1994. Obviously, that actually let it go up a little bit. You, if it was as easy, we'd all do it, wouldn't we? We'd all peg to the currency, the dollar at a lower level, and just sit back forever and have high export growth forever. Mm -hmm. And it would be a wonderful policy. But it doesn't work that way because eventually you get internal inflation, which makes you uncompetitive. That's what China is today. So it is only a matter of time until the currency has to come down. Okay. Um, when you wrote your book all that time ago, Anatomy of a Bear, um, you talked about how the next great bear market would play out. How does what we've just talked about translate into your view on markets as a whole? Well, fortunately, in the 2009 edition, I actually put in a bit in the, in the preface saying, actually, they're going to go up a lot first. Phew. Yeah, indeed. 
So uh, there were signs that the deflationary expectations were overdone, that inflation was coming back. And I said, we're in for a huge rally in the bear market. Well, it's been a bigger rally than I thought for sure, because I thought that was probably coming to an end by the middle of 2011. Mm. And since the middle of 2011, I've been writing about deflation and why that would inevitably bring the market down again. And of course it hasn't. But it is worth pointing out what has come down since the middle of 2011. So emerging market equities peak in April 2011. Commodity prices peak in September 2011. So some things have been in a bear market since 2011, but clearly not the developed world equities. So if someone said to me once, well, you've got everything right except the market. Well, given that my job is to get the market right, that's not a great consolation. So I've been wrong in the market for three years. So what I note from financial history is the thing that can bring markets down quickly is deflation and runaway inflation tends to bring them down more slowly. And I just see so much evidence of the deflation out there that I think that's what brings them down. And, you know, I've been saying it for three years, so maybe one day it will be right. <laughs> what will be the turning point that makes it right? I mean, you, you say you see deflation all around you, yeah. uh, you expect more deflation, so what, why haven't markets come down already? This presumably mm. is down to the constant money printing. The dollar, I think, is key to this. Uh, no, the dollar... I'm, a little chart of the dollar in my brain. It's only in the last three or four months that it's really become strong mm -hmm. and really become a, a, a very strong broker up on the upward side. I think that's the catalyst. You know, I can analyze all these factors, but until the dollar starts to go up, that's when you say, well, this, this could be the time. So people will ask, why? What's so important about the dollar? Well, there's so many people who a, link their currencies to the dollar. So if you link yourself to a strong currency and you have to force your currency up in line with the dollar, that on the whole forces you to a tighter monetary policy. Mm -hmm. But worse than that, it's highly borrowed across border. So the world is full of people who borrow dollars, take their money and invest it in RMB, invest it in Indian currency, invest it in Brazilian real, and they use it to fund assets or purchases in those currencies. Now when the dollar starts going up, you're effectively short the dollar. There's an old quote in financial history from Daniel Drew, one of the first great speculators, and it goes like this. It says, he who sells what isn't his and buys it back or goes to prison. If you've borrowed dollars, put it in RMB, and the dollar starts going up, your board is going to say, cover it. Don't cover 100% of it, because it may not continue, but cover a little bit of it. So there's these very rare periods in financial history where you get forced buying of the dollar as people seek to cover it. And if you look at the chart of the dollar, it looks we're like we're now. there. And forecasting currencies is incredibly difficult until you get forced buyers. And it's beginning to look like that. And there's nothing in the historical record that suggests emerging markets will ride that out smoothly. This has always been the time when they've got into trouble. So, you know, the forecast was there three years ago. Deflation, well, we certainly haven't had inflation. But the thing that might mean this is the time is the strong dollar. So how do we invest? Assuming you're right, which I'm sure you are at some point, well, I, how, do we, how do we invest to deal with a, a really fairly extraordinary environment? Well, like I believe that the, the beauty of being a private investor is that you can do nothing. Now, I know people watching this would not agree with that, but believe me, your options to do nothing are significantly stronger than the, the ability of a professional investor. But there's no such thing as nothing, because nothing is holding cash, right? Well, that's what I and mean And this by, is not a nothing. Well, that's what I mean by doing nothing. In a, in a period, if, unless you think I'm completely wrong and we're heading to rampant inflation, and of course I could be, and if that's your view, if that's your view, you don't own cash. But we're at least in a period of low inflation. I think most people would agree with that. Now in a period of low inflation, you're losing something on cash, but perhaps not a lot on cash. Uh, it's a quote, and I've often tried to find out where I read this by Adam Smith, but he once said that the greatest cause of distress amongst men of wealth is feeling that they have to do something. Apparently Winnie the Pooh said something very similar. So if Adam Smith and Winnie the Pooh thought it was good advice, I think it remains good advice. You have to wait for the right opportunity. I mean, if I look back to the in financial history, now certainly before World War II, the great financial uh, success stories, the great wealth accumulators were people who had cash at the bottom to buy, whether it was Rockefeller, JP Morgan, Mellon. Now that all ended post-World War II because we never had deflation. Mm -hmm. Having all that money to buy assets, cheap assets from distressed sellers, hasn't really been much of a policy in the post-World War II era, but we've never lived with a period of deflation. So if you, like me, and you genuinely believe that that deflation's coming, then you take from the playbook of Mellon, Rockefeller, Morgan, Carnegie, and you're ready to buy. So it's not doing nothing, as you say, being in cash. But in a period of low inflation, it's as close as you get. And you wait for what Buffett calls the fat pitch. And I can't 
You know, there are very, very few fat pitches out there, but in a world of deflation, there'll be quite a few. Is your own money in cash, Russell? It is, largely. Is it? it has some Japanese equities hedged back into the dollar, mm-hmm. and apart from that, it's pretty much cash. No Chinese equities, the basis of this wonderful consumption boom coming? I've never owned uh, Chinese equities, and I probably can't say I never will. Uh, I think my problem is that I started life as a lawyer, not as a stock market forecaster, speculator, whatever people want to call me. And a lawyer looks at things in a slightly different view. A lawyer says, is this entity that I own for my benefit? And the answer to Chinese equity, in many cases, but not all, is no. Mm. And if I am buying, putting my savings to own an entity which isn't generating profits for my benefit, why would I bother? And I'm sure there are very good fund managers out there who can pick the ones that do. And there are some that clearly do. But in the, on the whole, they don't, and therefore I don't want to be involved in it. I'm guessing this knocks Russian equities out of your portfolio as well. That is the correct answer. <laughs> is there any market at all that you would dabble in apart from Japan? No. No, okay. But, and people, should, but people should know this. I still have money in all the equity markets because I might be wrong. Now, it's a very low weighting. I won't say what it is. It's not a huge percentage. Uh, but I, it's public knowledge because I'm on the board of two investment trusts and they are global investment trusts and because I'm a director my shareholdings disclose so I have money invested across the global stock market but it's not a huge percentage and it's you know I think even the most bearish person in the world would probably have 20-30% of their money in equities uh, because you might be wrong. What about gold? Are you holding any gold just in case? You're just a little deflation. bit, but not very much, because as a deflationist for three years now, I've not been that keen on gold, but, and it's a big, very big but, uh, at some stage, if monetary policy doesn't work, we get something else. And that's going to be government activism of some form. That's what we've discussed. We discussed it in context of uh, forgiveness of student debt, but it could be something else. It could be exchange controls. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to know what it could be. Now, when you move from monetary policy to government activism, then I think that there's a a chance that that reinvigorates gold, because obviously it's a confiscatory issue. If people believe that the state is in the business of confiscating their assets, and you'll meet people every day who believe that already, We don't have to see it in action for them to believe it. But if that becomes a prevalent view, then even in a world of deflation, it's likely that the gold price uh, would go up. So people people would legitimately say, well, are you bull or a bear? What are you actually saying? And what I'm saying is this. As a deflationist, you should know it. If it starts to trade up on bad news, then it's in a very prolonged bull market. Because the tinkering that the government does is bullish for it. And when the government finally gets us back to a world flowing with milk and inflation, that's very good for it. So I think, you know, somebody who tries to take a very long-term historical view, watch it trade. Okay. And if it trades up on bad news, then that's the time. But it doesn't look like it's doing that at the minute. Russell, the other thing you've done recently, which is really interesting, is set up a new library in Edinburgh called the mm. Library of Mistakes, which is jammed full with books on financial disasters. Now, if you were to imagine what the next group of shelves would be filled with, what's going to be their subject? Okay, well, one thing I've learned in the Library of Mistakes is that one of the most dangerous times in financial history is when people need an income and they chase yield. And particularly there's something magic about 5%. And you see this in the novels and works of Jane Austen, that it's the people, when interest rates go well below 5%, it's the people who chase the 5% who end up with financial ruin. I believe we have an exact modern equivalent of that, which is pensioners who are chasing yield and emerging market debt. And they've been sold this as a fairly safe, low-risk investment where they can get the magical 5% that everybody needs to live on. There are many, many reasons why that isn't the case. Uh, financial history is just littered with examples of, of companies and corporations who borrow in one currency and invest in another currency that get, in, get into trouble. Uh, in fact, in Benjamin Graham's uh, post-war publication, The Intelligent Investor, if you look at that, basically, he said the first rule is ne- never lend money to a foreign government. Well, this isn't worse than foreign governments, these are foreign corporations. Uh, So with a strong dollar coming along as well, I think that's bringing that home to roost. Now, particularly worrisome is the way we've packaged it. This debt rests in open-ended funds. The history of lending to emerging markets was really bank debt. And if one country went bad, we didn't, the bankers didn't necessarily pull their money from the other countries. But when you put this stuff into an open-ended fund, and let's pick a country like Ukraine, for instance, that wouldn't necessarily pay you back, It may not be possible to liquidate the Ukrainian debt. There may simply not be a market for that debt. So the man who runs the fund, or the woman who runs the fund, when the redemption comes, finds himself 
liquidating something else. So the word's contagion. When you, when you package something like this, it can be in, inherently contagious as to how this spreads. And I believe that's what we've done. I think that will clearly have a role to play in the, in the library of mistakes going forward, which is how come the world's developed world pensioners thought it was safe to lend money to some of the most dangerous and risky uh, governments and corporates in the world and they're dangerous and risky for one simple reason they borrow in one currency and they invest in another it's always been dangerous it's coming home to roost and uh, maybe we should have an annual prize an inductee into the library of mistakes well, I think that's and an excellent idea the library of mistakes is never ever going to have enough shelves thank you Russell I think we can summarize that by saying uh, there is deflation there will be more deflation hold lots of cash have some piece in case you're wrong and never take your eye off gold yeah, and there's nothing wrong in doing nothing. Thank you. We've seen price falls in the housing market in the past, in the early 90s, and they went down 50%. And I think that we're at the start of that kind of decline now, as I think indeed fairly soon we will be at the start of that in the stock market as well.